intercultural communication and power first, and then uh, at the three o'clock, intercultural communication and ethics. So, we have four hours in front of us. So why should we study intercultural communication and ethics? No, power, that's the first part, the ethics later. Well, I think there is one motivation which is common to both power and ethics. That is that, I think you've seen this before, we have no choice. Because of the uh, transportation technology, big differences between poor people and rich people, etc. People are going to move from one part of this planet to another. People are going to uh, meet other people who have very different cultural backgrounds. In such meetings, power differences often play a role. In fact, I think it's somewhat naive to study intercultural communication without thinking a little about power differences that could become important in such intercultural meetings. Uh, so, what we're going to do now for the next two hours is trying to go a little into what those power differences could be. Trying to analyze them a little more in detail. <coughs> so, let's start because this is a, it's a seminar, so I want you to be a little active. Now you get a few minutes, talk to your neighbor, try to give an example or a definition of interpersonal power. Okay, let's hear, let's hear some of the uh, descriptions or definitions that you've come up with. Who wants to start? Okay. Yeah? Affecting or influencing uh, some other person's behavior and decisions. And? and decisions or perceptions of reality. Affecting or influencing some other person's behavior or decisions or perceptions of reality. Well, that's not, that's not too bad, I would say. That's, anybody else have another suggestion? Yeah? Trying to control or dominate some other person's behaviors or Tr activities. Trying to control some other person's behavior or activity. What's the difference between your two definitions? Control part. Control. Uh, control. Control is a little tougher than influence. Your, yours is softer. You cover more. You, it's enough if you just say something soft at the breakfast table. You might say, for example, to your wife, uh, perhaps that dress isn't your nicest dress. That's power in your sense. You might influence her to go and change her dress in this way. That would be very soft power. That would not qualify in her sense. But that's true. I mean, we are, we are here, we are at one area that where people disagree. How soft can the influence be for you to have power? Is it enough that you just make a small suggestion? Do you have power then? People will have different answers, I think, there. Another difference between your two definitions was what? Anybody notice? Yeah? No, I think he, he had something about behavior and activity too. No, but actually he had something more that you didn't not have. He had perceptions of reality. So if we have propaganda and we tell people to see the world in such and such a way, is that power? In his sense, yes. In your sense, perhaps not. If it, if it doesn't uh, give rise to any kind of uh, change behavior. In, in your sense, they would have to give ch rise to change behavior. In his sense, it's enough if their mental view of the world changes, right? Yeah. So he, in general, has a wider definition than you do. But this is actually the way it is in the field, too. Some people have wider definitions, some people have more narrow definitions. He's, he's satisfied with just having influence. He also wants the mental side to some extent. And you are more interested with control and behavior. Now we'll have a look at what I thought. <coughs> so 
So I said, A, A has interpersonal power over B if and only if A can control behavior or thoughts. So I was on the control side and not so much on the soft influence side. I might even call that influence in fact. <laughs> okay, but I was also on the mental side with you, but I had a wider sense than you did because you just had perception of reality and thinking could be more, could be other things. Okay, yeah? Well, if you are an authority, then you are a person that people turn to because they think you have great insight and you can uh, maybe teach them something, stuff like that. So authority can also be a property of a person. Power is a relation, right? I have power over you. Authority can perhaps also be worded as a relation, in which case you would have to say, I have authority over you. In that case, if you do it that way, it's a special case of power. Okay? But if you just say, you are an authority, it's, why it's more of a, you know, a kind of property that might give you power, but it also might not. Uh, a quick question. I mean, uh, we have soft power and hard power. Yeah. So you don't actually have, it's not actually necessary to be able to influence somebody directly in order to have, you know, that's basically the definition of soft power. So you want it even softer than your neighbor? Well, I mean, if you agree on the definition of soft power and hard power, yeah. then from there we can you know, extrapolate that the definition of interpersonal power should include soft power as well. And then we have... Um, the how soft? Well, but we, uh, then we have factors such as uh, status differences, uh, office now power. Absolutely, we'll come to that. But how so? <laughs> well, uh, the definition of soft power itself is that you, uh, the other person acts um, according to your interests without you having to ex exact power directly. That's the definition of soft okay, power. Okay, okay, okay. So it's because certain, let's say, social structures are set up in a certain way that other people act in your interest. It could be authority from yeah. office, for example, it could be cultural he hegemony, yeah. Yeah. and so on. Okay, so if that's supposed to be uh, taken care of by my definition, I have to work on the word control here. So I have to have soft control <laughs> in that case. <laughs> Which I am not sure I would exclude. I agree with you. That's an interesting case. It's a more kind of indirect exercise of power. And we're going to come back to that. I, I agree. So, I mean, that's, that's a possibility that we could introduce soft and, what did you call the other side? Hard power, Hard power and yeah. soft power. Yeah. Why not? <clears throat> okay, I compared my definition here, and you can compare the, ones, the other ones that you've heard here to the definition given by Giddens, who is a well-known social science authority, <laughs> you might say. Um, and he writes, by power is meant the ability of individuals or groups to make their own concerns or interests count, even when others resist. Power sometimes involves the direct use of force, but is almost always also accompanied by the development of ideas, ideology in brackets, which justify the actions of the powerful. Well, as far as I can say, see that this is completely compatible. In fact, it's a special case of the definition I'm proposing. It's just more wordy, more verbose. It's mentioned a number of details which are not, uh, which are interesting, but perhaps not essential to the definition. Uh, so I, I have included uh, also the case where the other person does not resist, but I think he has also, because he writes, even where others resist, okay, but that's not excluded by the definition I've given. So they, 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 they are compatible, it's just that mine is a little, perhaps a little wider than his. Okay, now one important thing that is, which I've already mentioned in the answer to your question, that interpersonal power is a relationship. Uh, if A attempts to control, exert power over or dominate B, and B does not accommodate, yield to A, let him or herself be dominated by A, then there's no power relationship. 
So if I say, uh, stand up or I shoot you and you refuse, I have no power over you, right? I shoot you, I did, but I didn't have any power. Right? So, you know, I, you have to go along. If you don't go along, there's no power. So acquiescence, which means to go along with power, is a relational act in an interactively co-constructed relational power. So it takes two to tango. It takes two to have power as well. <coughs> Okay, so now we come at the uh, low part of this slide. There is, but because of institutionalized power distribution, there can be unilateral manifestations of power. This is the same case as you brought up with the soft power. So, because laws are written in a certain way, or I, I all, the king always acts this way, the king doesn't have to think about the fact that he has power people will just acquiesce and let him do whatever he wants to. He doesn't have to exercise any power. He's just there. And because of the laws and conventions and so on, he gets power. So the relationship um, does not always have to be that clear because of customs, habits, etc. We can also talk about uh, different cases of, of this power relationship. So it can be symmetrical. If A and B, if A has power over B and B has power over A, it's a symmetrical relationship. But if A has power over B and B has no power over A, it's asymmetrical. Now, asymmetrical power relations can occur in many places. Can anyone think of a place where we have symmetrical power relations? Huh? Husband and wife? Husband and wife? Husband decides over wife in some ways, and wife decides over husband in some other ways, and maybe it tends to be equal in the end. So that would be a symmetrical power relationship. But there are, you, you can use your own imagination. There are many cases where you could imagine. Two friends, for example. Huh? Close friends. Close friends, yeah. Could be like this. Yeah. <coughs> So now we come to the question, how can power or control be exercised? Let's hear some of your answers this time. Who wants to start this time? Yeah? Uh, I think there is uh, two ways to show uh, power control. It's uh, non-verbal and verbal uh, performance. Okay. In that way, the one can send signals or, or not okay. uh, about their own power. Yeah, okay. So if I turn to you, hello, <laughs> I, could, I could say to her, stand up, or I could, is that what you mean? <laughs> yes. More or less. I mean, that's included. Huh? That's included. That's included in the verbal and the non-verbal. Uh, but it's, it's an example, one verbal and the other one non-verbal. Yeah. Right. yeah. Okay, other ideas? Uh, yeah? It can also be through uh, some structures and uh, uh, procedures within an organization. For example, uh, a superior will use uh, some uh, structures and uh, rules within the organization to exercise the power. Uh, it could be uh, directly or verbally uh, by s speech or talking to or it can also include uh, uh, issuing or using uh, directives and orders and stuff like this. So actually you're, you're on the same uh, line of thought, we might say, as the man behind you, right? Structural restrictions on, on behavior which are imposed by society. And that, that's another way. It's, it's not so easy to see as the uh, non-verbal or verbal directions. It's a, it's a much more uh, maybe subtle way of getting people to do certain things. Um, sometimes there might be no direct instructions at all. It's just that, you know, you see everyone else acting this way, so you act that way too, but nobody's actually told you to act that way. For example, if you start to, I don't know, uh, drive a car or a bicycle on the street, you see everybody else going on the right side, so you go on the right side, but nobody ever told you to go on the right side. It could happen, right? Or, or something else like that. So you just follow the customs and those customs 
actually have an inbuilt power structure. They, they are in favor of some people, they're not so much in favor of others. So that can happen, yeah. So that, that goes to this uh, question of more indirect or soft power. Okay, yeah, those are, those are, yeah, you want to say? Yeah, uh, I think there's also uh, two ways. Instill fear or reinforce fear. Yeah. Yeah. In college, for example, I can say do this thing or I will fire you, or do uh, do this thing or I will give you a reward or a bonus or something. Okay, so that's the old uh, carrot <laughs> and the stick. You know, you give people uh, punishment or you give them a reward. Okay, so you give them something positive. It's also called positive or negative reinforcement. Yeah, those are two ways of exercising power. Maybe the positive way is. Um, more with soft power and the negative is more with tough power, hard power. Yeah, I agree. That's another way to divide it. Yeah? Yeah. I was wondering, can we say that um, you can exercise power by brainwash and propaganda? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Brainwashing and propaganda. That's right. That's also a more indirect way. Yeah. yeah. Because if you get people to see the same way, see the world the same way you see it, they will tend to act the same way you do, which is what you want them to do. Right. So that, that's another more indirect way of exercising power. Yeah? Um, we were thinking of, like, you can condescend and talk down to people. Yeah. There's also a way of kind of <coughs> how you exercise power over them. Like, you, you talk down to them in a way that their opinion isn't worthy of what they're, what they're saying is relevant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That, that might be an effective way of controlling their behavior. It could also lead to resistance and opposition from them. It's not clear that always being condescending actually has the desired effect. Especially not in a more democratic type of society. <laughs> Let's say you did that to, to some teenage boys in Sweden. Do you think they'd go along with you or would they rebel? <laughs> it's hard to say. <laughs> It's a, yeah, it's, it's not a, I think it's, it's questionable whether it's always, a, you know, that always leads to exercise of power. It's a manifestation maybe of your own belief that you have power, but whether it's a good way to exercise power, I don't know. Yeah? In some way we can manipulate people in the way we construct our speech, uh, like how we put words, which words we use, and it's some kind of power as well as another person, so it's from linguistic aspect. Yeah, but that's sort of similar to the brainwashing, right? Yeah. Sort of an indirect way to get people to, to see things the way you see them, and, and then they will act along your desires, right? Yeah? Um, I've sort of based it on you know, the, the classical, well, one of the classical definitions of power it's, it goes from military, political, in, um, informational and economic. So if we are going to uh, see this through a communicational perspective, it could be threats, uh, norms and peer pressure could be the um, uh, mirror the political aspect. You can have withholding information or using propaganda would be, again, the informational aspect and using persuasion or self-interest. Uh, would be the economical aspect. Yeah, you, but you can break those things down into more micro. Economy. Well, you can always yeah. use the ethos, logos, pathos. Yeah, you in could a way break of it even down to that. Yeah. But you can, yeah. So, but what you can see now is that we've mentioned maybe five or six different ways of classifying this. And uh, well, one of you could write the master's thesis, compare, comparing these different ways of classifying the exercise of power and coming up with some way you know, in which you could describe all of them. That would be a nice theoretical contribution. Okay, let's see what I thought. I just had two, which we have mentioned. So my, I just have the positive direct way. So that could be either carrot or stick, if you like. Uh, and then I have a more indirect, implicit way. Brainwashing or making laws and so on. And then I also mention here thirdly, the fact that sometimes you don't have to do anything because people have been influenced by their environment to act in such a way that it is in your interest. That This is the uh, soft power uh, case, you might say. 
Um, okay. Yeah. Maybe it could be by role model. Yeah. So let's say your mother always does what your father says, and then you follow your mother. <laughs> then your father will be happy. But he never told you. You did it anyway. <laughs> that sort of example. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Another, another big piece of terminology here: that if A controls B, A is dominating B, and B is subordinate to A. Okay, so now are all intercultural power issues issues of communication? So are discrimination and exploitation issues of communication? My general answer to this question is that less so the more indirect the control is. If there is a rule, law or convention permitting A to restrict or force B's actions or behavior in ways which are in A's interest, what is required that is that B follows the rule, law, or convention. A does not really have to personally communicate this to B. B could find out from other persons who are being restricted or enforced in similar ways. Okay, so that means that it's not, it's not, at least it's not a case of direct communication always. You might say if you go back historically, Somewhere along the line, there's going to be somebody who tells people to do it this way. But it might not at all be right now, or it might not be one of the people you know, or so it could have been much further away in history. So it's not always so easy to see that communication, direct communication, is a part of cases of discrimination and exploitation. Uh, Okay, so but what we want to get closer to is this question of to what extent is intercultural communication a means for establishing, maintaining, or perhaps changing power relationships. So let us pursue this. So one question we have to uh, address is when do we actually have intercultural communication, if that's what we're going to study. So do we have intercultural communication when we have two people from two different cultures who are communicating? Some people say yes, some people say no. Some people say no, you don't have that unless these people are aware themselves that they have two different cultural backgrounds. Okay? Some people say no, that's not enough. In fact, they have to behave in such a way that the difference in their cultural backgrounds plays a role for the communication. People, and that people, yet another camp says, no, that's not enough. They have to call it intercultural, intercultural communication themselves. So here you have four positions. The widest is, yeah, whenever you have two people with different cultural backgrounds, intercultural communication. Number two, if they are aware that they have different cultural backgrounds, even if it doesn't affect their interaction, it's intercultural communication. Number three, if it affects their behavior, the fact that they have different cultural backgrounds, it's intercultural behavior, intercultural communication. Number four, if they agree to call it intercultural communication themselves, it's intercultural communication. Okay, how many people go for position number one? Okay, how many people go for position number two? Awareness. Some, okay, two, three. How many people go for number three? Influence on behavior. A little more. How people go? How many people go for have to characterize it themselves as intercultural communication? No. Okay. So uh, most of you, I think, I got about 20 people to commit themselves. The rest of you have not thought about this question sufficiently, so you made no commitment. <laughs> okay. Um, I myself, I oscillate between position two and three, I might say. I think it's not reasonable to call something intercultural communication just because we happen to know that two people are from different cultures. And there's, that in no way affects their communication. They're not aware of it, etc. I think that's, that's a very wide uh, sense of intercultural communication. Okay. <clears throat> now, this is related to an issue in the social sciences that you may have run into before, namely 
whether we should take the perspective of the participants or whether outside analysts' perspectives are just as good. So, should we always follow what the participants themselves think that is going on, or are we allowed to step outside and say, okay, these guys don't know that they come from different cultures, but they do, so this is intercultural communication. Okay? That, that's like uh, an outside analyst is able to come up and say, okay, I know what's going on here, but the people themselves don't. Okay, this is, if you have two people who are drunk, and you know, you know that they've been drinking, and then you ask them, you're just saying that to him because you're drunk, and he says, no, it's not, I'm not saying it because I'm drunk, I, I, I really think that. So, who's right? <laughs> is it the, the person, you know, the outside person who notices that they've been drinking, and he gives that as the explanation? Or is it the inside people? <laughs> I think you can all see that in different cases, both of these perspectives are actually reasonable. It depends on what we're talking about. Sometimes an outsider's perspective is reasonable, sometimes it's not. And sometimes only the insider perspective is okay. So sometimes the insider perspective is called member orientation, or sometimes emic perspective. And some schools of sociology and anthropology think that this is the only thing you can allow. But other people in the social scientists, for example, Marxists, like the other side, they talk about people having false consciousness. So if workers are you know, working for a capitalist who is exploiting them, and they don't realize this themselves, then the Marxist analyst will say, they are misled. They don't understand what's going on. They have false consciousness. And I know, because I have the right theory. Okay, so you can see that in the social sciences, this is a controversial question. My own view is that both perspectives are reasonable. And depending on what we're discussing, we use one or the other perspective. Okay, that's also going to be true when it comes to power. Here we can ask exactly the same things. If two people are communicating, have different power, but they don't, are not aware that they do, let's say the janitor and the director of a big international business happen to meet in a bar. They don't know what their background is. They're discussing with each other. Is there then a power difference? If you as an outside analyst know that there is, you'll say, yes, there is. If you have the emic perspective, you say, but it in no way came up in the conversation. So there was no power difference. You have to think, yeah, you have to think yourselves what position you're taking. So the same way you can ask, you know, if they're aware, if they, when they sit there, are aware that there might be a power difference, there is a power difference. If that power difference influences their actions, there is a power difference. If they, when asked, classify their own conversation as one where power differences was playing a role, it's power difference. So exactly the same four cases as when we discussed intercultural communication can be brought up here. The same questions about outsider's perspective versus insider's perspective can be brought up here also. And I would again myself give the same answer. Sometimes both perspectives are in principle possible and can at different times be reasonable. Okay. So a good question. What, what about subconscious? Subconsciousness. Subconscious. I mean, they could be subconsciously aware that you know because of how they talk. You know, the uh, the, the the businessman talks more fancy. Yeah. And so on. Yeah. Or I don't know. Maybe they are at a biker's bar, and you know the um, the other guy has the upper hand because yeah. everybody look, else looks like him, or so on. But this is these are things that are people they are aware, but you know on a subconscious level. Yeah they don't actually think about this. And so their brains are processing and are aware of the uh, difference in power. Yeah. Now that, that's an entirely possible case. And in the taxonomy of four possibilities that I gave, I think it would be a subcase of number two, then, mm. where you have some sort of awareness of the power. And you might say, of course, that's a kind of minimal influence on the communication. It, it, it's an awareness which is sort of coloring and maybe then you would say it probably will also color your behavior. A, a psychiatrist so, would say that the subconscious has a very large influence on how we behave. I, I agree with you totally. 
And I, that's that's certainly a possibility uh, and one that mm. that we should look at here too. Yeah. <coughs> Okay, so one terminology that you, I think you might have run into in the interpersonal communication course is these uh, terms indicate, display, and signal, where indicate means that uh, you can draw conclusions about me without my wanting you to do so. So for example, I am not right now communicating to you what my, uh, what should I say, ages <laughs> that you might have been, draw been drawing conclusions about that without my having communicated it, communicated it, okay? That's, a, that's, a, that's an example of indicated information. I'm not, communic I'm not trying to communicate this to you, but my behavior is such that you can draw certain conclusions. I'm, I'm informative, you might say, in a certain sense without intending to be so myself. That's in the case. The next stage is where I actually want you to be aware of some kind of information. That's display. So I do some things to try to show you that I have certain qualities. I don't know what, in my case, uh, <laughs> I'm happy to see you. Say. I'm trying to smile so that you'll understand that I'm happy to see you. So I'm displaying happiness. Okay, the next stage, I would want you to um, not only realize that I'm showing you something, but I also want you to realize that I'm showing you that. So I'm showing that I'm showing. When I talk, when I say I'm happy to see you, that is actually happening. Because the words indicate or show you that I'm showing you something. So normally verbal communication is signaling in this sense. So when we look at power, we can ask the same questions. When is power indicated? The person has power over the other person, but is not really aware of it themselves. The person wants to have and show the other per person power, trying to regulate the other person in some way. And the person not only wants to do that, but wants the other person to realize that he is doing that. That's signaling power. So we can use these, these distinctions also in analyzing power relations between people. That, I'm just showing you this to show that power can be integrated, integrated with the more general theory of communication. And, and we can use concepts such as these to understand power. Okay. Now, we're going to call to the sources of power. And there are many different sources of power. In principle, I'm going to be looking at two different sources of power. One is a macro political, macro social political status differences between different national cultures and languages. So you could say that in the world today, if you come from the most powerful nation, do we have any Americans in this room now? Oh uh, well, if there had been any, I would have told you that uh, you come from the most powerful nation. <laughs> okay, now uh, we'll come to what that, by virtue of belonging to the most powerful nation, that gives you a certain status. We'll come back to that. The other kind of source is looking inside. So this is like between cultures, you might say, between national cultures. Some have big, greater status than others. The other source is within a national culture. There are many different sources of power. If you're a director of a company, you probably have more power than if you're a worker in the same company, etc. So, and we'll look more closely and such intracultural relationships and how they give power. And we'll notice that some of these are long-term relations and some of them are more short-term relations which have to do with being in a particular kind of social activity. So right now, I have more power than you because I'm the lecturer. But once we have a break, which we will have in one minute, that stops. <laughs> we have more equal power. 
Okay, so that's a very short-lived power. Well, I actually have more power still because I'm, I, you know, I'm a professor and employed at the university. So there are other factors like that. But but you can see the distinction. There are more long-term power relationships, and there are more short-term, which have to do with the activity you're in, etc. So now I promise you a break. We will have a break, and then we'll continue after the break to discuss. Oh. Before the break. I said we would talk about different sources of power within cultures and between cultures. And there were these two basic kinds, microsocial political differences and then various kinds of uh, in sources within a culture of power. So if we start with the macro social political differences, then uh, language and cultures primarily dominate as a consequence of dominance established commercially and militarily, money and guns. You think about the world languages, when was Latin a world language? Well, when the Romans were the mightiest empire. When was Greek the most important language? When the Greeks, Alexander the Great, had marched from Greece to India, etc. When was French the most important language? When Napoleon Bonaparte was conquering most of Europe and Russia, etc. What? When was German very important? Before the Germans had lost the Second World War. Why is English the most important language? Of course, money and guns. Uh, no, no way around this. So, being associated with a powerful nation could also give the language of that nation and the culture of that nation great status, and that is what we actually see. And as I said here today, the most powerful nations, uh, the most powerful culture and language is probably English. And if we want to guess at number two, well, some people might disagree. I've written Chinese, but who knows? Maybe it's not quite settled yet, but uh, you know they have a lot of first language speakers in China. In China, <laughs> they are working hard to become uh, economically stronger, and now they're even trying to flex their military muscles. Have you been following the last weeks? This demonstrations against against Japan. They, they the try to, huh? the yeah, those islands, exactly. Small problems with small rocky islands. The Chinese are trying to show that they are as tough as the Japanese. We'll see. <coughs> yeah, you want to say something on that? Is what? Is ours? Is that what you said? Do we have any Japanese people in here? No. Nobody to object. <laughs> Nobody to object. <laughs> right. But, you know, if we go to various countries, we'll also see that within those countries, we often have several languages spoken. So, for example, are you aware that in Sweden, Sweden is not the only language which is an official language? What other languages do we have as official languages in Sweden? Huh? Sami, yes, the Laps. Anything else? A certain kind of Finnish, which is spoken up in Pornedola, uh, called uh, uh, Mianchieli. And uh, actually, the Gypsy language is uh, also an official language of Swedish because the Gypsies have been here for 500 years. And uh, perhaps even more surprising is that Yiddish is an official language of Sweden. So, if you uh, look at all these languages, it's, no, it's very clear that Swedish is dominant, right? None of these other languages have the same status. And Sweden is typical in this respect. If we go to, this, to Russia, we'll see that there are many more languages than in Sweden. And it's no doubt that Russian is the dominant language. And, you know, if you go to country after country, and there will usually be a dominant language. There are maybe a few exceptions to this. One such exception is Switzerland, where we have Italian, French, and German. It's hard to say which one is dominant. German. Ger <laughs> you think German. 
Well, we have uh, just uh, one uh, one region. Yeah. Germany has them. If you go by the number of cantons, it yeah. would be German, but I'm not sure that's the only measure. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to say. Yeah. Okay, so we have such dominance relations. Okay. Now, if you're a member of one of the dominant groups, let's say you're a member of, you come from England or America, you'll go to an international meeting and that meeting will be conducted in English. Of course it will be very easy for you to be dominant. It's your language, it's your culture. You have all these other people who are trying to learn that language and culture and they only learn it to a certain extent, so of course they are in an underdog position. So because people who are from a dominant nation, dominant culture, speak their own language, use their own culture, they are also then the judges of what is the right way to do things. And when we go around the world, we'll see that people who come from such dominant countries and nations, they also tend to be dominant in immigrant hierarchies of other countries. So if you look at who's treated the nicest way in Sweden, probably you'll find the English speakers top on the list, followed by the other neighboring Scandinavian countries. More or less like that, and then it's harder to say. <laughs> but you find such hierarchies in most places. And this kind of dominance can, from the point of view of those who, ha who are dominant, they might not be aware of this. So we come back to this problem of awareness. I'm an English speaker, you know, and I, you hear very often English speakers say, oh, we people who come from England or America, we're hopeless at learning other languages. So here is a naive person, you know, who's sort of saying this, and I, of course, think it's because you're so damn lazy and you don't have to, you know. That's what I think, but that's not what that person thinks. They, they, they go around and now oh, we cannot, we are, you know, and then they continue to speak English. It's a matter of course that everyone else is going to learn how to speak their way. So they, they might be unaware and they might not intend this, but it will still be the outcome. So here, that, you know, and as I wrote here, this might need an analyst to be pointed out to these people. Now, sir, I don't know if you've met people from America, they often say, you know, I'm hopeless at other languages, I can't learn anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, I give you a task. Try to think of some cultural differences in what is regarded as sources of interpersonal power. So we're leaving the first topic, that is, the, the macro-social political differences. We've discussed that. We're now going to go to what is regarded within cultures as sources of power. And that might be different between different cultures. That's what I want you to think about. Knowledge. Knowledge. Yes. That is regarded as a source of power in some cultures and not in others. Is that what you're planning? Yes. yes. In which cultures is it a source of power and which cultures is, is it not? It's a source of power in every culture, then it's not an example of what we wanted one which would vary. Okay, you have one? Maybe family background, for example in India uh, people have different power according to the caste they came from. And in other cultures, like in Sweden, it's not such a big deal from uh, who is your parents. Well, not just in India. The, yeah, okay, so... Um, where, where you come from, your family background, in diff this is actually, you could say with knowledge, it's something that could give you power everywhere, but it's done in very different ways in different countries. So in India, as you say, caste is very important. In Sweden, what was very important here? If you, for example, uh, are from aristocracy? Yes, or? if you're a noble, if you're an aristocrat. And so, until 1860, the aristocrats had their own, you know, the Swedish um, parliament had four, four parts. Mm -hmm. One was reserved for, for the aristocracy. And normally the prime ministers, all the ministers and so on, came from the aristocracy. They had a very privileged position. 
And still today, if you belong to one of the noble families, it's a good thing in Sweden too. Let's not think it's not. <laughs> okay, so family background can be very important. And it has been, in most parts of the world, very, very important. That what, that what regulates the whole society. So that, yeah, family background is an important source of power. And how important it is and what kind of family background will vary from one culture to another. Anything else? Maybe the status of teacher is different in different countries. So knowledge, teacher? Yeah, but it's not quite, it's not about knowledge, it's more about social status, uh, just being a teacher. In China, as I know, the teachers has very high, um, a very privileged uh, position in society, right. and not that privileged probably in Sweden, school teacher, I mean. Right. Okay, so probably it is assumed that teachers have some knowledge but you're saying irrespective of whether they do or not they yeah, <laughs> they are respected so. yeah i agree so china is a country where there is a great uh, respect for teachers laoshi okay washi laoshi washi nida laoshi is that correct nida <laughs> okay so that's very important and you get status in china in sweden a lot less and we have a problem in this country in recruiting enough, for example, male teachers. Yeah. So that's true, yeah, the status of being a teacher and indirectly knowledge, you might say, in that way varies. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, the age and position of work that matters. Yeah. We have discussions in our group work. Yeah. If you're an older person, you uh, expect uh, more respect and you have more power yeah. than, for example, in Sweden, it's not that important to age. Correct. In many, I would say all of the traditional cultures of this planet, age is important. It's only in those cultures which have distanced themselves from, let's say, traditional conservative ways of being that age has become less important. But it's a general feature of all traditional cultures that to actually respect older people. And that means that older people, respect means that you give them power as well. That's true. And that's a great source of variation between the cultures of the world. Yeah? Like one's physical, uh, how physical, yeah, <laughs> might be more important in one culture. Than yeah? So body size, for example, I'm a tall person and I can dominate by virtue of that. Right? Or maybe if you're one that relies on hunting a lot, maybe that's important for your sources of interpersonal power. Hunting. Yeah, that's okay. So the kind of job you have, your vocation, could give you power? Okay. Sure. In some, if Stone Age societies, for example, being Let's a hunter. A tribe, huh? A tribe, maybe, that a relies tribe, a lot on hunting. Other, yeah. Dif different societies would, would give different jobs. Good, good status. Yeah, that's true. So, job, yeah? Maybe in that case, the whole appearance of a person can be uh, implementing power. Like, I read the article, for example, that in Korea, if uh, people are investing in their own uh, good to make uh, plastic surgery to look better, yeah. this grants a bit better social status. Yeah. You are that, that's true, but it, you're normally the way you appear is, a, is, a, is an effect of your background is to some extent, right? So actually I think that's a more superficial criterion and it might not be as long lasting as some of the other things we've discussed here. Because you know, if it turns out that actually you look good but you, you're not of the right caste in India, it might not help you. You should be a Brahmin and not a Parya. Yeah? Being a blonde is a cultural difference. Being? A blonde. A blonde? Yes. Yeah, and that's good in some places and not so good in other places? Like, uh, uh, the way uh, the, the tourists come to the uh, Germany and the Scandinavian countries, yeah. Yeah. they don't feel that much puzzled when the Scandinavian go to Spain and and those countries. I'm just wondering, being a blonde is a cultural difference. Can we just put it in that category? Well, it's a racial feature, I would say. You know, and of course, race is important as a source of power and has been very important. I mean, it led to slavery for some people and so on. It has nothing to do with the culture. It's not culture. 
but you could have people who dye their hair. You know, they buy they buy the hair hair dye and they dye it themselves long because it has high status. It could be. I mean, then, yeah. It's, it might be uh, um, native inhabitants of land. For example, in Russia, on the north, we have these tribes like Hanty, Mansi, and they have some kind of power over us or other Russians because, for example, they get accommodation for free if they want. Uh, they have they go to university without passing exams if they want to. So that's kind of power too. Oh, yeah. I don't know if they have any power over you. They have no, an easier over, situation. But in society in general, you could get certain advantages in in a particular society if they have said that a certain uh, let's say group of people or a certain race will have privileges. That happens in many countries uh, still today. So if we take, for example, Malaysia. Is there anybody here from Malaysia? No? Well, in Malaysia there is a quota system. So if you belong to the Malay race, and they say race, it's easier for you to get the job in the civil service. It's easier for you to go through university than if you're Chinese or Indian. So I mean, this is a kind of racial yeah, quota system, which has been present in many countries and cultures, and still is in some places. Okay, let's look at my list now. Age differences, yeah, we've talked about that. Gender differences, in many places being male is uh, more powerful than being female. Differences in education, so having higher education in many places gives you, gives you more power. Uh, perhaps you might say that in all places this, these things happen to some extent. Maybe age differences have been under the greatest change. So in countries like uh, Sweden, America, etc., age has been devalued. While in a lot of other places it still has a little greater value. Gender differences in the same way in countries like Sweden and America, females have become more powerful. Other parts of the world, males are much more powerful. Uh, differences in education in the same way we've seen the kind of egalitarian striving in countries like Sweden, America, but still I think education gives you some more power. Differences in family, clan, caste, we've talked about that. That has become less important in uh, most of the Western world, but uh, uh, is still very important in other parts of the world. Um, differences in ethnic groups, sometimes race, we've just talked about that, it makes a big difference in some parts of the world still. Differences in wealth, those who are richer usually have more power than those who are poor. Uh, differences in organizational and political position, being a political leader, well that's maybe the clearest sign of having a lot of, uh, of power, however you might you might discuss whether a political leader has more than a capitalist leader. That's one of the issues sometimes debated. You know, some people say that it's actually, I have more power if I build up my own company and I have a big company than, than if I work politically. This has, for example, been a discussion in, in South Africa, where I think, do we have anybody from South Africa here? But man number two in South Africa right now, forget his name, but he for a long time chose to be in private business because he, he said that it gave him more power than being number two in the nation. And now uh, he changed his mind about two or three years ago and he came back into politics. <clears throat> we'll see, maybe he'll become number one because number one is behaving in some strange ways, as you perhaps have noticed. Yeah. Uh, Excuse me, I think yeah. there's one thing missing, that's celebrity status. Celebrity status, yeah, uh, you're right. That does give you power in certain places. That's true. For example, film stars in America, or uh, yeah, that, that, or sitting in the TV sofa and being interviewed on some topic might give you. But sometimes that power is somewhat uh, transient. Perhaps it doesn't last that long, but it could last at least for, for a year or two. And so yeah. Um, so, the expectations concerning such differences might differ between participants in communication and cause surprise, disruption, misunderstanding, discomfort, and dislike. 
So if you come from a country like China, you might be expecting, if you're old, to be treated with respect. You come to Sweden, nobody treats you with respect. Vice versa. You come from Sweden, you're old, you come to China, and you notice that people are treating you with respect. So what do you think? This is a great place, I want to stay here. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. So things like that. <coughs> okay. Some intercultural sources of power vary a lot in strength between cultures, others less. So those in black here, I have made them black because I think they vary a lot. Age is not equally important in all cultures, as my examples have indicated. Gender is not equally important in all cultures. Differences in family, clan, caste, not equally important everywhere. Differences in ethnic group or race, not equally important everywhere. A middle status, I think, has education. So that's more or less important everywhere, but perhaps not very important. The most important things everywhere, differences in wealth. I think there's no single country on earth where being rich does not give you more power. That's always important. And the other one is differences in organizational and political positions. If you're the leader of the country, if you have high positions in an organization, fine. That's the nature of your where you are. You can control and have power over other people. So that's very clear. So those two things in red, they are universal. They give you a lot of power. But all of these things give you power more or less. But the ones in black vary the most. Yeah. <clears throat> then we have the more short-lived power, which can happen because you step into a particular kind of social activity. So many social activities have a clear difference in the power which goes along with being in a particular role. So if you're in a meeting, the chairperson has more power than the participants. The chairperson can usually decide on the agenda, who gets to speak, how long they speak, etc., etc. The participants cannot decide on such things. Doctor-patient. Doctor usually has a lot more power than the patient in a doctor-patient consultation. Teacher-student. That's where we are now. Teacher has more power while the lecture is lasting. Afterwards, we don't know. Okay. Uh, Judge-accused. Same way, judge gets a lot of power over the accused while the trial is lasting. And these differences which have to do with being in a particular social activity can be added to organizational differences in position. So if we have a formal meeting where the boss is the chairman and the employees are participants, the boss has two sources of power, being the chairman and being the boss. But if we have a formal meeting, where one of the employees is the chairman and the boss is a participant, then we have a clash between sources of power, which might be interesting. Because then, you know, the boss is going to try to play his power cards, but he isn't really in command, so it'll be more difficult. And so you get more interesting, politically more interesting kinds of maneuvering going on. <clears throat> okay, and such differences can then be added to differences in ethnic stages, age, gender, etc. So normally we have many different power giving features that a person can carry around. So you can be both boss, I don't know, of the right uh, gender, of the right uh, cultural background, right language, etc. etc. And that would add up. But sometimes you instead have conflicting features. So let's say you're an American woman and uh, you're not the boss, but you're the chairman of the meeting, chairperson, I should say, in that case. So you, there you can see, you know, it's uh, slightly different, it's more mixed, and you get more, yeah, you, the, the reactions of the participants in the meeting are going to be a little more difficult to predict. <coughs> okay, so here we have 
the uh, properties then you can belong to a certain macroculture, you can have certain long-term properties of the time we have been discussing, gender, age, etc. And there can be activity roles. So basically these three types of properties can be there to give you more or less power. And basically we have two kinds of relations between these properties. They can reinforce each other or they can be in conflict. So if A belongs to a dominant culture, let's say he's American, he's boss, and he's the chairman of the meeting. All the properties reinforce each other, more and more power, A dominance. But we could also have the case that A belongs to a non-dominant culture, less power, A is educated, more power, A is doctor, but the patient who sits in front of you is, let's say, we have investigated this in Sweden, so we've had Swedish patients and foreign doctors, so the Swedish patient knows the language better than the doctor, knows the culture better than the doctor, but the doctor is still the doctor and knows about medicine and treatments better than the patient, we hope. And so there's this clash of competences and power. And so those conversations, we have recorded a lot of them and you find interesting patterns developing. More interesting than if all the sources of power cohere. You want to say something? Yeah. Yeah. Um, in case uh, of the doctor and patient, yeah. who has the power? For instance, if uh, a patient is a president, is the president now yes. we're getting conflicting power sources? Yes. yes. And <laughs> then uh, this is just a doctor, and then yeah. this is a president. Yes. Then who has the power there? Good question. <laughs> Let's say that the doctor is employed by the president to be yes. his personal doctor. <laughs> yeah, you might well say who has the power. The only way in which the doctor maybe has more power than the, than the president is in the knowledge of medicine, right? In all the other ways, it's the president who pulls the strings. Probably the president can get the doctor to do more or less what he wants. Can I say something? Yeah? I think it is about relation between patient and doctor. It doesn't matter the patient has the position. If this is a president or if this is a cleaner or this is any regular ad, uh, trade eater, you know. The, the point that we are coming to doctor is that we are giving the doctor something that does not have any price. This is our health. So in this case, I would not see any difference between a president, a doctor, or some other person. Understand? This yeah. is why are we coming to doctor? We right. have problems with our health, and our health has no price. Right. So when when we study communication and, for example, questions of power, it's very important to make a distinction between a normative approach and a descriptive approach. Okay? So we could study the way things should be like, and we could study the way things really are. What you just said, I think, is a normative statement. You're telling us about how things should be. <coughs> but unfortunately, things are not like that very often. Doctors are not incorruptible. They are corruptible like everyone else. And they can do what the president says. So they can do what the great medicinal company who is paying for their vacation tells them to, you know, the medicine they're supposed to dish out, etc. We have seen very many signs of such weaknesses. So that means it's very important to distinguish between yeah, an analysis where we say about what should be the case, which I think is what you're pointing out, and an analysis of what really is the case. I'm sorry. <laughs> The world is not always as beautiful as we would like it to be. Yeah, but look, I'm sorry, but look, uh, everybody are going to die. Everybody are having health problems. So right. in this case, this is a matter of this president. He's on stage. But it does he matter in fact. He needs some surgery. No, it should not matter, but it does matter. Some people, you know, pay a lot of money. They go to very nice private hospitals. They are treated like they're in a six-star hotel. So, some people go to very poor hospitals where they get to lie in a room with 10 other people and they get hardly any treatment. Why? The only reason power money. But this is about politics. Well, of course it's politics, but it's also about the way the world is rather than perhaps the way it should be. Yeah? 
for example, you have the cases where people want to do uh, operations like beauty operations, uh, which may be controversial, and one doctor may, may not want to do it because it's so controversial. They want to change your whole face or yeah. whatever. But if you have enough money or enough, you know the right contacts, you might be able to do it anyway. Right. Uh, so that's a case of the power there with the wealth. Yeah. No, but especially when you're studying power, it's important to have those two perspectives. The normative, what should things be like? People should be equal, it should all be nice, everybody should be treated the same way. And the descriptive, is it really like that? Or are power differences playing a role in what's happening? And both perspectives, I think, are of value because if we didn't have a normative perspective, we wouldn't know what we would like in order to change the world in a certain direction, which perhaps we sometimes want to do. Just a quick question. Is yep. there any uh, research regarding the reinforcement if it's a, an arithmetic or an exponential increase? Ooh. I invite you to do that research. <laughs> I haven't seen any such research. It would be interesting. Why don't you write a little paper on it? So yeah, maybe. The question, what was the... If he asked, or you can refer to If it's an arithmetic or an exponential increase, for example, if you have to multiply the factors or if you just add them up. What was the original question? I didn't okay, he, he's, I'm saying that if, I, if I'm American, I'm male, and I'm the chairman, I have three sources of power giving me more power. His question sort of presupposes that we're able to put a number on this, okay? So we're saying American gives me three, being male gives me two, being chairman gives me one. Now he's asking, how should that one, two, three relate to each other? Say it again now. Yeah, if it's an arithmetic or uh, an exponential increase. So basically, is it five? Uh, sorry, is it six? Well, it's six in both cases. Yeah. But <laughs> in this case, yeah. I gave the numbers the wrong way. <laughs> but say the, la the last number would be two. Then yeah. it would be three by two by two. So that's uh, 12 if it's an exponential increase. Or uh, only uh, seven if it's an arithmetic increase. So. Sorry. But this presupposes that it's actually quantifiable. possible to quantify this, to put numbers on the amounts of power you have, which making might not, not be so easy. Making yes. a quantitative research. Huh? Uh, making a qualitative research to a quantitative research. Yeah, that, they, should, they always go together. But, it, you know, it, it takes ingenuity sometimes to see how they go together. It's not so easy. Yeah? <coughs> yeah? Okay, sometimes people disagree. So maybe you come from a culture where, you, let's say you're a feminist. You think that men and women are of equal value. They should not have differences in power. Maybe also say that you're, uh, let's say, a youthist. So you think young people should have the same amount of power as old people. So you come and you meet this person who thinks that old people should have more power and that males should have more power. So now there will be a power struggle. Young woman against old man, let's say. <laughs> they have different ideas, you know, who's going to win this struggle? What happens when people have different ideas about who should have power for, the, yeah, for different reasons? What happens in such interactions? If anybody wants to write a paper, you know, getting in recording situations where you have different ideas about what gives power and what happens in that kind of interaction, that would be very interesting. I, I'm willing to uh, be your... Uh, supervisor or guide along with such a paper. We need more such research. Okay, <coughs> power stroke. Uh, okay, now let's go to the question, how is power shown up? How do we see that power is being exercised in, in people's behavior? Are there cultural differences in the behavior manifestation of power? You have a few minutes to discuss this with your neighbor. Okay, let's hear some of your answers. Who wants to start? Yeah? Uh, it can be manifested in non-verbal behavior. Yes. For example, the one who has more power, a boss, in the conference he might be like sit more relaxed and often yes. and uh, his uh, subordinates who has less power, they might sit a bit more close. And you can see difference. And it might be the difficult She's saying that the people who have more power sit more relaxed and the people who have less power sit more tense. 
Well, it's very general, but... Yeah, um, no, that's your example, right? Yeah. And in, in the same in cultural difference uh, for non-rural non behavior, for example, maybe in some cultures, if someone has a power, other person, per, people will vow him. Vow? Vow him, yeah. yeah. In Sweden, nobody will vow you, even if you have a, a, probably a power. In Sweden, when I went to school, we were all taught to bow, bow to other people. Okay, but Boys are supposed to do this, girls are supposed to do this. <laughs> okay, we don't do it in Russia. <laughs> Russia, you had communism, we didn't. <laughs> but I don't know, today people perhaps don't do that in Sweden, but uh, if you were over a certain age, you were actually taught to do it. And handshake, for example, a president and someone lower, President can give a hand for shake first, but someone of very low, like a cleaner, he will not come up to President and uh, give a hand for shake. So the president will take the initiative to the handshake, not the cleaner. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. All these are good examples of what power people might do. Other examples? Yeah. Um, I come from the Middle East. Yes. And the Gulf countries, especially. Uh, Gulf countries. Gulf countries. Yeah. Uh, where are they are monarchies, the, the leaders in general, and uh, the, whenever there is uh, like a public appearance, they kiss their hand. They literally like uh, the the king will do like this. Yes. And I don't know, like the ministers, the guests, or whoever, they just kiss their their hand as a way, uh, which is a behavior completely acceptable, and it shows the power structure. And there is also a very interesting image of Obama when he visited Saudi Arabia, and he did the same also. He kissed the king's hand? He kissed the, the hand of the Saudi king. So I thought that was good. <laughs> yeah, that, that, I agree. That's a very clear manifestation. I agree. Other examples? Uh, I think form of addresses in some countries uh, uh, people use uh, for the people uh, for, for people with uh, uh, yeah, in, in general, forms of address are a good field to look at for power differences. In our especially. They're very, very clear. Use of titles, use of formal pronouns, etc. One of the clearest manifestations of power differences. Also the way in which you refer to other people, actually. You refer to him as the president, the Mr. President has said that. Or you call him uh, Barack has said that. You know, that's a clear difference in how, how the status of that person. Yeah, let's have a look at what things I had thought of. So, uh, I think that there is a universal, we start with something which is not culturally different. That uh, if you have more powers, you have greater freedom to do whatever you like. So I think your examples were all in line with this, in fact. Uh, so you can have freer movements in all different kinds of cases. You have bigger movements, freer movements. If you have less power, constrained movements. The bow, everything is like that. You're making yourself smaller in front of the big guy, so to speak. So it's always a sign of being bigger, freer to do whatever you like. And this, I would say, is a universal. You have a freer choice of what to do. If you have less power, you have a more constrained choice, more respect, more politeness, etc. Now, in both the case of people who have a lot of power and the people who have less power, it might be that you're in a conventional setting where there are roles which, is to some extent, constrain your freedom. So if you're the king, in principle you can do what you like, but if you're at the Nobel party where you're supposed to give prize to a Nobel Prize winner, the king could not, you know, stand. <laughs> he is constrained by the role of being in this prize-giving ceremony. So he cannot. So sometimes the activity and so on will constrain people. But in that activity, the king probably has greater freedom than a lot of other participants. Okay. Yeah. If the king did that, what do you think would happen? I think, uh, especially in Sweden, where the king's status has been degraded to some extent, like, <laughs> he, would have, he would have a hard time. <laughs> do you think anyone would stop me? 
Uh, maybe, maybe the Queen. Take it easy. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so if we look at some of the uh, features of, com of communication, such as turn taking, if you have more power, easy access to turns, you can take over, you can speak as long as you like if you have more power, and uh, you have freedom to interrupt other people, and you have freedom to ignore other people. If you have less, less power, shorter turns, except being interrupted, and you cannot really ignore when somebody with more people, with more power, talks to you. You have to respond. But it is not, uh, it's the naturally occurring uh, conversation. Yeah. And you are not, uh, there is no factor of institution in it. If you are in If I'm a bigger guy, you and I meet on the street. I'm stronger than you. Yeah. I, the same things are going to come into play. Yeah. But if, <laughs> if you are in a new interview and you are a host and I am an interviewer, yeah. then you have some constraints. Yes. Um, That's similar to the king being in the price of money. Yeah. You know, there's a, a conventionalized activity which curtails some of these tendencies. So the context may... may is important for how power can be manifested. Sometimes the context, uh, yeah, limits the ways in which the uh, power can come into free expression. Okay, feedback. More power, free choice of feedback. So I can say, that's good, that's good, that's not so good, etc. If I have less power, there is more obligatory choice of feedback. I cannot really vary it the way I want to. Sequences. Uh, when I have more power, I have freedom to initiate. I can ask you questions. I can greet you, etc. If I have less power, I really have to wait for the other person's initiative. That's who gave that example. Uh, somebody said you have. To, you, I cannot extend my hand. Was it you? Yeah. I. But I, I'm the. You know, the president extends the hand, not the worker. That's exactly this kind of thing. <clears throat> uh, manifestations of power. You can give, if you have more power, you can judge other people. That's really good. You did a very good job there. I'm judging you, for example, now here. I'm saying that's right, that's wrong. Typical power that the teacher has. Compliments. You can, that's good, that's a compliment, right? And criticism. So if you have more power, all of these things can be more freely given. If you have less power, you have to watch it a bit. You can try. I mean, if somebody with less power tells somebody with more power something nice, it's, there are words for that which are not so nice. One word is ingratiate. It means that you try to get on the good side of that person. And it's, so you have to be a little, you know, sometimes it's nice for the persons who have done a good job to hear it, but the person who is doing it, have to watch it a bit, right? It's not so easy. It's easier for the one who has more power. Um, topic, perspective. Free choice of topics, perspectives. Free choice of agenda if you have more power. Less power, you have to go along with the choice of topic, agenda, etc. of the person who has more power. Forms of address, we talked about that. Much more polite forms to the people who have power. The people of power normally say, I want respect, I want respect. <laughs> and those who have less power, you know, they have to give that to them. And so that's a general complaint in Sweden, that people say, young people have lost their respect. Maybe that's true. That means they're not as polite as they used to be. They don't do this, without, which I was taught when I went to school. They don't, you know, they don't do all the formal greetings. They don't use the titles, etc. That has... We've had a political development where the forms of address, and that to a large extent has to do with egalitarianism, evening out the power differences. Okay. Um, so manifestations of power, more powerful, choice of topics, perspectives, issues, judgments, forms of address, pronouns, greetings, less powerful constraints on all of these things. Yeah? I wanted to ask you, what about voice pitch? Voice pitch? Yeah. 
like uh, that the stronger person is usually even talking louder and more lower tone than the one who's uh, in lower uh, power. Like he's he usually speaks more silent or or a bit lower. Pitch. In some cultures, higher pitch goes with having less power. Yeah. And lower pitch goes with Too having more power. Yeah. But it's not a universal. It, it's more culturally relative. I was, for example, in Finland three or four days ago. And you notice that in Finland, it's a kind of power and status thing for males. Oh, do we have any fins in here? <laughs> it's more noticeable. I'm, I'm, I'm interested. Tell me more. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's called creaky voice in phonetics. It's Swedish, not Prussian. And it's more common with males than it is with females, but it, extent, it occurs also, I've noticed, with Finnish females. You, try, you listen to the Finnish radio, and you'll hear a number of these people that get you coming up. Oh. <laughs> But it's a it's a it's a low F zero if you talk phonetics and it has this creaky voice quality. And I I think it gives Finns the impression of a stable, you know, reliable person. Good person. Actually in Russia we have some yeah. teachers who speak very quiet. The same way? Uh, who speak very quiet teachers because they think that if they have power yeah. they can speak quieter. Everyone has to still listen to them and be very quiet. Yeah, so that's speak. one way of doing it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But I wouldn't say that not Christian is something that is for power in Sweden. I think it's Sweden well, too. I wouldn't say because I think no. it's more annoying in Sweden. Yeah, in Sweden I think it's not so clear, no, not at all. No. No, I was claiming this for Finland, not for Sweden. Okay. <clears throat> so conclusions. Power relations in intercultural communication derive from many sources and exhibits cultural variation. The first thing we talked about is socio-cultural macro relations between different ethnic groups. Second thing, cultural attitudes to long-term attributes like age, gender, family wealth, organizational power. Third thing, role in particular social activities. But we noticed when we started to look at the behavior, which is manifesting power, that we find a kind of universal, namely that the people who have power have greater freedom to do in basically what they want. Of course, constrained by the social activity that they're in, but they have more freedom. And when we look at actual communication, all of these power sources are mixed. They can be reinforced or they can be in conflict. And they make, as I would claim, power an interesting topic that some of you, I hope, will choose as a topic when you write your master's thesis. Now we're going to take a 15-minute break, and after the break we come back and we discuss the evidence. <coughs> now we're going to pass from power to ethics. Both of these subjects are, of course, quite important when we are looking at communication, specifically into cultural communication. So we'll start by discussing what ethics is, and then we'll look at some problematic situation. We're going to look at what if there is a universal ethics, what cultural differences might exist, and we'll look at the, the relationship between ethics and intercultural communication. Okay, so we'll start by trying to define ethics, and since this is a seminar, uh, I would like you to try to give a general definition, uh, or if you're not able to do that, a description of what ethics is. Uh, yeah? Can you speak up a bit? Sorry, I'm, sorry, I'm getting cold, so... Uh, yeah. Rules or behavior is of, of what is morally good or bad? Rules or behavior concerning what is morally good or bad? Okay, this leads, of course, to the question, what is moral? Because, of course, the words ethics and the word morals, they are both <coughs> closely related. 
But yeah, I mean that's a, that's an okay definition, but it's also an okay question for me to ask them what is what. Socially accepted. Huh? What would be socially accepted? Ethics is what is socially no, accepted. Morals. Morals, but not ethics. Yeah. Morals. Okay. Socially accepted. So, but let's see. If we use her definition, then ethics is what is morally acceptable, and morals is what what is socially acceptable. By transitivity, ethics is what is socially acceptable. Yeah, and sometimes uh, something is socially accepted, but it's not ethical. Precisely. Could we give us an example of that? It's like the use of the PDF version. Sometimes they use it before the first year. It's unethical, but it's now socially accepted. Use PDF, which is supposed to be PDF, so to prevent people from copying. Yeah. You think it's socially acceptable to do that, but it's ethically unacceptable. Okay. Do you accept this counterexample to your idea? Yeah. Also, corruption in certain countries. Corruption is is ethic is socially acceptable in many places. Yes. But perhaps not ethically acceptable. Yes, I agree. So maybe it's not sufficient to say that ethics or morals are what is socially acceptable. So what is it then? Yeah? Ethics are uh, the opinions of what is right or wrong, the right or wrong actions in different situations. Ethics concerns what is right or wrong. Okay, that's one but, view. But maybe based on the what is socially desirable. For example, corruption is not socially desirable, but it could be socially accepted. Okay, so you want right or wrong based on what is socially desirable. So driving on the same side of the street, on the right side, is socially desirable. And uh, I think meets your question, it's also the good way to drive in Sweden. Uh, but is it ethics? Ethics doesn't have anything to do necessarily with the social. Yeah. Ethics has nothing. Here you have to. Here's a man who wants the social, and here's a woman who doesn't want the social. Okay. Yeah, I know these are these are two well-known positions actually in the debate of ethics. There's a social logistic perspective, and there's a more non-social logistic perspective. Yes. I saw some other hands. I think anybody else wants to say something? Yeah. Example is the CSR, the Corporate Total Responsibility and the Code of Ethics. CSR? Yes. Can you tell us what that means? Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's some codes how, how to, to run a business with uh, less uh, effect on the environment and less trouble or the people who work for the company. Okay, so. Kind of code of ethics that, uh, this is not a definition of ethics, it's an example of ethics. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, right, I agree. <coughs> that is true, it's an ethical code for businesses. Yeah. Okay, let, I'll show you my suggestion for the definition. So I define it this way. Beliefs, norms, principles, and rules for how to achieve the well-being of others. So here, uh, it's central that has to do with the well-being of others. What those others are, but let's say we can primarily right now think of them as people. But we'll find that that's not entirely unproblematic. Uh, so examples of ethical norms do not hurt others. Do not lie or mislead others. Do not force people to do things against their will. And these are all ethical rules or principles. So all norms are not ethical. To drive on the right side of the street or on the light, left side of the street is a norm, but it's not an ethical norm. To spell in a certain way a word, W-O-R-D, <laughs> is a norm, but it's not an ethical norm. 
And it is the right way to spell it. It's the good way to spell it. So the words right and good do not necessarily always help us. Because they also apply to non-ethical cases. It has, you have to have this thing about the well-being of others. Why? Otherwise you get spelling rules as ethical norms. But you don't want that, do you? Yeah, about norms. Yeah, but they are norms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But not about ethics. I mean, you don't want all norms to be ethical norms, do you? Yeah, yeah, sure. But I mean, I would say that ethics is not necessarily about the well-being of others. It could be an egoistical thing. Okay, that, that's why I said the word other is problematic. Yeah. There are certain people who believe the word consists only of themselves. So yeah. That, yeah, this, yeah, would yeah. Be a, this would be the limiting border case. Others, there's only one other, it's me. Yeah. yeah. It's a possible limiting case, I agree. Yeah. But here you have some examples of norms which are not ethical necessarily. Traffic rules, musical scales, spelling rules, norms for greeting, norms for eating properly. These are not, none of them are really ethical norms. But behaving unethically can mean to break an ethical rule. That is to break one of these rules, do not hurt others. So you hurt somebody, then you have behaved unethically. But it could also mean breaking a non-ethical rule in such a way that it has unethical consequences. So here is your mother who is trying to teach you how to spell. And you decide my mother is harping on me too much. I'm not going to learn how to spell. So she gets very upset because you're not learning how to spell. And you don't care. You continue to misspell all the time. Now, now the consequences of your breaking the spelling rules are unethical. Because the consequences which you are aware of are that your mother is going to be upset. Okay. So sometimes breaking a non-ethical rule can have ethical consequences. That doesn't make the first rule ethical, but it means that you have a kind of combination of the non-ethical rule with the ethical rule of not hurting another person. Then that is what is making the whole case ethically interesting. Okay? So those are two cases. You might say direct breach or indirect breach. Okay. So ethics concerns beliefs, norms, etc., about how to behave toward others with a concern for their well-being. So which of the following norms are ethical? Do not hurt others, do not lie or mislead, do not force others, don't be a burden on others, always be generous to guests, always do your duty. Follow the Ten Commandments in the Christian Jewish Bible. Always work hard. Always defend the honor of your family. Always eat in a civilized manner. Always spell correctly. <laughs> where where do, do the ethical norms stop? Yeah? I wouldn't say four and five are ethical rules. You wouldn't say four and five? And seven? You wouldn't say seven? You know, seven uh, contains things like don't kill, don't steal. <laughs> there are. Some of the. I read it in a way not about like what you should do concerning the ten Christian rules or the Jewish Bible rules, but uh, that we don't, that we shouldn't only kill, we should not only not kill someone because you're following the rules, but because you think it's wrong to kill someone. Well, that's the motivation for why you're following them. But the question I'm asking now, which of these rules are ethical? And you're saying that you don't think that number, what, three was? Uh, no, four, five. Four. Four, five. Some of the... Seven. Some of the... Are you saying all of the commandments are not ethical? No, four, five, and seven. Eleven. Okay, yeah. Okay. And I never any other culture, I so Can you speak up hot? I 
in any other culture. No, I agree and with you. To be generous to guests, it's a polite thing to be generous to guests. When they when you invite someone to your house, you treat him in a generous way, but it's not ethical behavior. If you only give them a slice of bread and maybe a slice of cheese, okay, it might not be super generous, but still you invited them and gave them something to eat. So okay. that's more about manner. Yeah. So actually you, you think one, two, three are okay, but then you start to get doubtful. You draw the line more or less after three, is that right? I think eleven is very obvious. Yeah. Because people that have for example how is it called? Yeah, you always change the Sure. This would mean that they behave not ethical, just because of their Yeah, no, we, I agree with your intuition. 11 is out. But then the question is how far no, up on the list. 10 is out as well. 12? We don't have a 12. 10. 10, okay. <laughs> yeah. Because it's nice to eat civil manners, but again, it's manners and nothing that is ethical. Yeah, yes. I agree with your intuitions. So 10 and 11 are out. Then you get more doubtful, or what? Yeah, I'm sure that's why I think we're cautious at the coast. Let's hear someone else now, okay? What do you think? Um, I think there must be a difference between socially and like, expectancy compared to ethical values. Sorry, louder please. Social, social expect expectancy compared to ethical values. So I think 8 to 11 feels like social expectancy more than ethical values. Okay. So you, you draw the line after seven. Um, no. No? <laughs> Why would you draw the line? I think the first three is for sure ethical and all others is debatable. You draw the line after three. Yeah, I think all others is debatable, it depends on what you understand. Yeah. And on depends on the situation. Yeah. No, I, I mean, this discussion reflects the way it is. I mean, it's not so easy always to say which rules are ethical, because some rules have ethical aspects, more or less, and some don't. Some are pretty clear not ethical, and some are much more clearly ethical. And then we have a number of rules in the middle where people will have different, slightly different intuitions. And we see that in this room as well. People do have slightly different intuitions. But that's the way things are, and, and to some extent this also reflects your cultural backgrounds. <clears throat> so, ethicalness is a matter of degree. The more serious the issue is for the well-being of others, the more ethics is involved. And usually the more universal the issues become. The less serious the issue is for the well-being of others, the less ethics is involved, and instead etiquette and politeness might be relevant. <coughs> Note, however, that some groups take etiquette and politeness very seriously. Shh. For example, I do. So I want it to be quiet when I'm talking. <laughs> okay, so etiquette means small ethics, and politeness, well, you know what politeness means. Okay. Uh, so now we come to this question of ethics versus morals. Are ethics a part of morals or morals a part of ethics? Different people have different views and sometimes, well, what do the words mean? Sometimes morals means personal standards, sometimes it can mean other things, but this is a pretty common meaning. Immoral sometimes means sexually open, but it can also mean many other things. If we try to look at the etymological origin of these words, we find that they have similar origins. So ethics comes from ethos, and ethos is just Greek for customs. Morals comes from mores, which is Latin for customs. So you can see that if we go to the etymological origins of these words, 
both of them have an origin in the thinking about social customs, the way we started this discussion, where we came to the conclusion maybe that not all social customs are ethical. But still, if we look at it historically, that's what people have thought. Customs, behaving according to the customs of the society. <clears throat> so, that it doesn't really help us. So my conclusion is that it's very hard to say <laughs> which word is more basic. Uh, I think the trend is to think that ethics is more basic than morals, but not everybody would agree with this. And that morals, I think there is a tendency around, uh, along these lines that it means more, more per personal standards, my morals. But the usage differs between different writers. Okay, so now let's continue to discuss these, uh, the ethical rules and let us now come to the question, who are the ethical norms valid for? And in what situations are ethical norms valid? So, just to give a report on your discussion. Yeah? Basically, when we discuss the for small children, small. small children, how can you uh, expect them to act ethically when you, they don't really know those norms to, to the fullest? I mean, so you think it's okay to treat small children unethically? No, that small children, it's okay for small children to act unethically. They, they sometimes act unethically. They're not aware of who the ethical norms are valid for, yeah. for example, for themselves. Yeah, yes. And then the other one would be military people? No, let's stay with small children. They're, they are they're not aware, but does that mean that they are not valid for them, even if they're not aware of it? I don't understand. Could you, I mean, if you're a mother and you're bringing up a child, and this child is stealing something, and is obviously not aware of, let's say, it's an ethical norm that you're not supposed to take things from other people. Does that excuse the child, or should you then try to change the child because you really think that this norm is also valid for the child? Uh, I think that you have to change. I mean, if he wasn't aware of something he didn't realize, then it's not his problem, it's his upbringing problem. So it's more like, I have to say, you know, not, it's not his fault actually. That's why, uh, for example, if a child, uh, be until age 16, whatever he does wrong or something, it's basically the parents that are more punished than the child itself. But we still regard the child actually as having ethical norms, otherwise we wouldn't try to change the behavior of the child. We, we believe that the ethical norms are valid for the child. But we believe that there is an excuse maybe in not being aware or not having enough reasoning powers and things like that. So. Okay, so maybe one could say that ethical norms are not valid for those people who are not aware of them and have no possibility of understanding that they are there, etc. So that's a group of beings, let's say, that, that perhaps have an excuse in not being aware and not understanding the ethical norms. It's true. But, but potentially the children are supposed to have these powers. So we are trying to cultivate them and therefore they also become valid for children. Okay, you had another group, soldiers. Yes. What did you want to say about them? Like, if uh, it's unethical to harm others, yeah. but what do soldiers do? Yes, good question. Does that mean that ethics are not valid for soldiers? Yeah? Do you want to say something? But I mean, we talk about ethics now as if it's a, a universal thing. Like, yes. Like, we say that it is unethical to harm others. Yes. But maybe, maybe in another, if you view ethics, the, or, or if you base your ethical norms on another way, in another way, then maybe it is ethical to harm others. Yes. Else in certain situations. So, so you, yeah, we're going to debate this a lot a little later, but is there a universal code of ethics or is there not? So some people believe that there are universal norms which are valid for all human groups, all cultures, and some people believe, no, they're not. They're all relative to specific cultures and groups and so on, and there is no such rule. We'll come back to that question. It's a good question. So you would say, who are the ethical norms valid for, but only for a particular group who believes in them, or something like that, right? Yeah, perhaps. 
Yeah. Okay. Other positions? Yes. In the confession one, I believe ethics are meant for every person who has sound mind. Okay, so we're back to the children now. If they have enough power of mind and awareness, then it's valid for them. Yes. Yeah. All right. Okay, so that's one position. That's different from this her position, which thinks that it could vary even if you are aware. Yeah? Um, what about uh, saving human life, stealing uh, in, order to, in order to save human life? Yeah. Would it be ethical to steal in order to save a human life? Since the life has more bigger value than the item or the thing you stole it. Yeah. So, in this question, in this way of view would be like, it's permitted to steal and do other things to, to do a bigger good or something like that. Uh, now you're coming into the question, what happens when ethical rules clash with each other? Mm -hmm. So we have the norm of not killing and not stealing and yeah, maybe we have to steal in order to save a yeah, life. But in this way, like if you ask yourself, who are the ethical norms valid for, like paramedics or military people? Like she said that you know, in the Sorry. battlefield, you can steal from a store to save some to save someone or do something else. So there are certain people who can bend rules or judge. I mean, act according to their judgment. You know. So this comes into the question, can we define certain groups that the norms are valid for, or but is it proof that for a particular person they might be valid no. sometimes and sometimes not? So when you're a soldier, they're not valid, when you're not no, a soldier, they are valid. No, I mean, in the no? North, no, because even yes. you are responsible, even you are responsible for, like, if you see a person who needs help, you're responsible to give help to that person. This is one of the crucial thing, the things you have learned when you were passing your driver's exam. Okay, so this if you're a soldier, thing. you are under obligation to not shoot somebody and to help them if they are wounded. Yeah, then you can steal in, in that case. Like, it's like, you know, Maybe breaking so, ethical rules. Are you saying that soldiers are also under obligation to help their enemies and to not shoot them, etc.? Yeah. So you have a very strong position. Yeah, help your enemies. Why not? That's that's okay. what the, uh, So you don't accept do. that soldiers are exempt from from this command not to kill. No, no. I, I'm saying that uh, in certain situations you can use your own judgment to bend the ethical norms. I'm not saying you can break them all the time. I can say you can bend them in certain okay. situations. But some people would say that soldiers are always exempt from the rule not to kill. Not always. Yeah. Because their rules are different in the, in the, in the state of... In, when they're in, in battle, let's in, say. They're always exempt if they're in battle. Exempt. Yeah, so in certain situations, they can bend ethical norms. Like, if you take World War II and Japanese, yeah. uh, I mean, okay. the atomic okay. bomb, so was that ethical? I mean, no. But did it help? Yes, maybe. <laughs> well, like some people will say that, that that was a situation with, which was exempt from the ethical norms then. And other people will say, like you, that it was not ethical. I'm saying like, what, it's like if they didn't do it, like the war could last even five years more. Yeah, and maybe so, but we're debating, you know, we're debating the question of when the ethical I'm just war... Saying it's like yeah, I hear you, but we're debating when they are valid and when they are not valid. And you're saying that in some situations, I don't know. You're, I, I'm not clear on your position. I'm saying that in some situations, they are not. So yeah, that, they are. okay, that's what you most people... You can't have a universal that they're always... Valid. No, that's what most people would say. There are certain exempt situations. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. But that could be... That exemptness could be anchored in groups of people or it could be anchored in, in situations. Okay? So you could have a particular person who is normally not expected to kill but when he is a soldier, he is suddenly expected to kill in certain situations. So that would be more situational than anchoring person. Yeah, uh, more about situation because there is another yeah. example which a uh, young uh, mother of a child uh, uh, heard a burglar in the, in, in the house and called the police and asked, her, asked the police if it's okay for her to shoot the, shoot the intruder. Right. And the police said, do whatever you have to do to protect the child. So yeah. it is ethical to kill that guy to protect herself and the child. In so, certain but countries, she wasn't a police officer, she wasn't even in the military. Right. In certain countries that's the way the law is. You can shoot in self-defense. In other countries it's not that way. So it varies a bit. But that's right. It's another situation where the normal rule not to kill is overridden by this consideration.
Okay, uh, let's have a look then at, at some of the answers. We'll start by looking at uh, groups of people that people have identified historically with uh, what, who the ethical norms are valid for. If you're a, we had one person here who said they could be valid only for myself, right? So that's number one here on the list. <laughs> a very small group. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to you know, treat myself well, but everyone else, I don't care. <laughs> okay, then we have a slightly larger group. They, they the people who say, well, I don't care about anybody but my family. And within my family, it's not, I'm not allowed to hurt other people, etc. But outside the family, it's okay. My kin, this is very, has been, historically it's been the case. If you go to a country like Somalia, Clans are still ruling that country to a great extent. So I suppose that within a clan, you're not supposed to kill other people, but between clans, maybe, okay. A region, some people believe a lot in region. So in old Sweden, it, actually we had laws where it was, uh, you had to pay different sums of money depending on where you came from in the country. So if you kill somebody from your own province, you paid a lot more than if you killed somebody coming from small numbers. <laughs> the price was a lot higher. And uh, okay, so you can see that region has been important. My country, very, and this is the soldier case usually. So uh, it's okay to kill people from other countries when you're a soldier, if you're at war with those countries, but it's not okay to kill your own people usually. Uh, some people have used gender, my age group, no? you know, when I was uh, a lot younger than I am now, there was a saying, you cannot trust anybody about 30. I don't know if anybody believes that still today, but who knows? My race, that's been around, my species, now we have all human beings. And now, I'll take another step, which some people are prepared to take, namely Buddhists, Jains, etc. All living beings, all animate beings. So that's a lot larger. You're not allowed to treat animals cruelly, you're not allowed, yeah. So, are you familiar with the Jain religion? One of the Indian religions? They have people who wipe the path so that you might not, by mistake, step on any insect. They are very, very careful. They don't want to kill any life. Yeah? Do you mean that uh, all living beings should obey the ethical norms, or that all I think I think uh, it, it, this applies to people who are able to understand the ethical norms. So I think it applies to human beings in relation to mosquitoes. <coughs> in, yeah. to mosquitoes in yeah. 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 yeah, you could say that's an asymmetry, which is a little strange in a sense. Why shouldn't the mosquitoes be as considerate of us as we are of them? Yeah, but I mean, if you see a gorilla killing a, yeah, another yeah. animal, for example. Yeah, you're right. Then this is a, this is like problem with that ideology, maybe. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so then you can see that this varies, and the opinions on these things vary from one part of this planet to another, and also within the particular culture. You know, there are people who are more egotistical will practice hand number one. And there are people who are less egotistical. So, okay. Uh, in what situations, now we come to the question of situations then. What situations are norms valid? What are the default conditions on such rules as do not kill? So we've already discussed this to some extent. These default conditions make Situations of war or executions exempt from the rule, do not kill. Yeah? yeah? You want to say something more on that? No, there is no? another aspect, I mean, you have to consider, I mean, in prisons, prisoners sentenced to death. Yeah, that's execution. The ethical should kill them. Execution. That's execution. Do not steal, again, war, you mentioned that, uh, but also expropriation. When the government decides to take away property from somebody, they say, okay, we have to build a road here. Unfortunately, your property is in the way. We take it. So most nations give governments the power to do that. That's a kind of stealing, you might say. Do not remove freedom. Well, you put people in prisons. That's removing their freedom. So all of these very central ethical norms actually have 
default conditions. Under some conditions they're valid, and then you find some conditions where they're not valid. Okay, so you can, in fact, this whole reasoning about default conditions or norms is, is quite interesting. So people have um, suggested that you could have two very general default conditions. Everything that is not forbidden is allowed. Okay? Everything that is not forbidden is allowed. That's sometimes said to be the convention, let's say, in most Western democracies. The other one is, everything that is not allowed is forbidden. Sometimes, when we had anti-communist propaganda here in Sweden, we would say, that's the way it is in the Soviet Union. I don't know if that's true, you know, but that's the way people used to say things. So, if we take the case of smoking, if you go by the first one, everything that is not forbidden is allowed. So if it's not forbidden to smoke, it is allowed to smoke. Okay. That's the way it used to be in most parts of the world, even here in Sweden. Then we now take the, another one. Everything that is not allowed is forbidden. Take the case of smoking. I think in Sweden nowadays, almost we've gone to number two. Smoking is forbidden unless somebody has told you it's allowed here. At least if you're in cities, and so maybe not that in the countryside, but if you're in, in a city, you have to look for a place where you're allowed to smoke. So if this is a case where a particular kind of behavior, smoking, has passed from default condition of type 1 to default condition of, of type 2. And maybe you can look at other behaviors in places where you come from, where you can see how, how the conditions of allowing that behavior have passed from yeah, the first type here to the second type. So how, and now let's go to another question. If we look at the way ethical norms have developed and arisen, one hypothesis might be that they arise from the needs of single people and then they are somehow generalized when that person realizes that other people have similar needs as he or she does. So if we have a norm like act according to your own will and intention, if you want to make that into an ethical norm, we say also make it possible for others to act according to their own will and intentions. So that's passing from having this need only for yourself to trying to make it possible for other people to have the same need. Or act according Number two here, act according to your own desires and motives. For example, escape pain and seek pleasure. If you want to make that into an ethical norm, then you say, make it possible for other people to act according to their own desires and motives for them to escape pain and pleasure. So don't hurt other people. Give other people pleasure. Number three, act as rationally efficiently, competently, and adequately as possible. That's for your own, you want to do that. But if you also try to make it possible for other people to act rationally, efficiently, competently, then it's an ethical norm. So it's passing from just looking out for yourself to looking out for the well-being of others. That, that's the step. Okay, so let's now, considering this, these for example, are these universal norms? Now, debate with your uh, neighbors, are there any universally, in all cultures, valid ethical norms? What does universal mean here? That's one of the things you have to say. Yeah? <laughs> Who has acquired an opinion and wants to report it? You have? Okay. What do you mean? Not yet. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we couldn't come up with anyone except stealing. <laughs> stealing? And, uh, that's a universal. Like, it's not okay. Where we go. And we like, know different cultures that we come, come up with. We found it in the city that we come to this place to kill. But we couldn't really find any kind of way to kill. So, so you're suggesting stealing is the universal norm, but killing, not killing, yeah, is not. Yeah. Okay. 
Ah, that's an interesting position. <laughs> yes, you? Uh, but I suppose what if you're stealing a gun from another person? Then he might kill you. So you're, she doesn't believe your theory. <laughs> <laughs> She's what saying that in war, if you steal somebody's gun, it's okay. No. Yeah, but what if he's going to kill you tomorrow? Is it okay for you for him to kill you? But we didn't say that we think that it's okay. But I mean, in some cultures, it is okay to kill. Like, if you steal, uh, you can be punished by death. In what culture? Where is it okay to kill? Yeah, but we yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, so the, the idea is that because soldiers are allowed to kill, it's okay to kill in some cultures. We'll come back to that. Other other opinions? Yeah. Uh, I think that there's some there's some ethics related to the professions. Sorry. Related to the professions, our jobs. For example, I have studied accounting, and we studied the. Uh, accounting ethics, yeah. which, uh, not only like for a Palestinian accountants, but all the uh, yeah. uh, accountants in the world. Yeah. Okay, so you're saying that uh, depending on what job you have, etc., yeah, there are different ethical rules yeah. for the different. Uh, yeah. Accountants have one kind of code of ethics, and I don't know what uh, academics have another one for you're not supposed to copy when you write a paper, etc. Yeah. I agree. That's true, but is that an answer to the question if there are any universally valid norms? Are you saying yes or no? You don't know, but you've answered a different question. Okay. Yeah? We came up with one like hard, like killing a pregnant, actually killing a pregnant woman. <laughs> killing a pregnant woman is wrong everywhere. Yeah, I think so. I, we tried to think of something where it would not be like you know, it would be okay, but cultures they accept it if they if they believe that the woman has been unfaithful or something like that. Yeah. Then you can kill a person, uh, a woman who is pregnant. pregnant. Really? Yes. Yeah, I think that's actually true by stoning her or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, any other opinions? Okay, we'll have a look at uh, what I came up with. So first of all, I want to draw your attention to the fact that there are many similarities between human beings. Let's not get lost in this uh, opinion that there are only differences between human beings. There are basic similarities concerning perception, cognition, emotion, and communication. I think you can give good arguments to show that all human beings are motivated rational agents. I think you can also show that all human beings have certain basic needs, like to, to eat food or to breathe the air, etc. I think, as you will soon see, that there are certain ethical norms, but we'll see what you say about that. Uh, need to take care of particular stages in life, being born, dying, coming of age, etc. Common foci for value, friendship, work, Rearing of children, relationship man woman, but different values. The same focus for the value, but the value itself might be different. Basic ways of producing food, basic instruments to produce food, and need for social organization. All of these I could tell a much longer story, but we don't have time today. But in this long list of similarities, I think you also find ethics. So Let's first look at how universal ethics might be produced. So here are three ways. Uh, one way is to say that they are given by nature. They are natural or innate. Uh, they are given by our genes, you might say. So we have all human beings are social beings. And by a kind of instinct, uh, we have, for example, a tendency to see altruism, helping other people, fairness, as a better thing than egotism. And we're not going to find any human beings who don't have this instinct, I think. I mean, that's an example. And that's one way of thinking of universal ethics, that is given by nature or by biology. Note, for example, that chimpanzees seem to have the same Genes. They also see altruism as a desirable quality. 
then number option number two is to see uh, universal ethics as something socially constructed. So we call together a meeting. We, we call representatives from all the 200 nations on earth and we sit down and say, can we agree on this? Can we agree on this? Can we agree on this? So if everybody agrees, then we have a universal ethical code, which has been socially constructed, not by nature, but by just by discussion. Okay? And we do have such a code. Or at least we have an alternative for such a code, namely the United Nations Conventions. Some a lot of people have criticized them, but they still are there as an example of such a code. The third option is if you are a strong believer in some religion, most religions claim that they alone know the truth, right? Christianity is the truth, Islam is the truth, Buddhism is the truth, whatever, right? All of these religions think we know the answer. They also give you a code of ethics. So, okay, if you believe in them, then of course that's universal, because it's, it's right for everybody. All the people who are not Christians or non-Christians, they're all misled, they're all wrong, right? So, this, this, is, a, this is alternative number three. <clears throat> you can choose whichever you like here. Personally, I choose a combination usually of one and two. I'm a little more dubious about number three. <clears throat> Yeah. Okay, so what about all the counterexamples we have discussed then? Uh, we have, have do not hurt others. What about soldiers who are allowed to shoot other people? Isn't that a counterexample to this idea? If you claim, like I would claim, that it is universally wrong to hurt other people. That universal here cannot mean in all situations, because obviously we have we said it's okay in some situations to hurt other people. So if we're going to claim that in all cultures it's wrong to hurt other people, it does not mean that in all situations it's always wrong to hurt other people. It means that in a set of specified situations, you're going to find in every culture that it's wrong to kill, to kill other people. So in the, uh, let's say the default, when it's not explicitly defined by the culture that it is, it, it is all right to kill other people, it is wrong to kill them. Okay, so if we're, you're not a soldier, you're not an executioner, uh, you know, uh, carrying out the death penalty, then it's wrong. If you belong to the right race, if you belong to the right group, it's wrong to kill other people. If you belong to the wrong race, okay, you might kill them. But all that's claimed here is that in every group, whatever they define as the right group for them and the right kind of situations, there's going to be a norm of not killing. That's what, that's what this means. So it means that it's a universality with default conditions. Okay, so positive answer leads to a need for contextual default specifications. Do not hurt others unless there are socially accepted reasons to do so. Okay, so you might say it's a weak form of universality. It's not the strongest form, because it doesn't mean in all situations for all groups. It means for that group which you believe is your ethical group, and in those situations which are not defined as outside of the normal situations. But if it's only for one group, then it's not universal. What I'm saying is true for all groups, we find that they will have this kind of rule. It's universal in that sense. All groups are going to have this kind of rule. Do not hurt others in our group. In those situations, you know, with, where we're not. Normal situations. Let, do not hurt others in our group in normal situations. How do you know that? I don't know, but it's my hypothesis. And unless you can come up with a counterexample, I'm going to continue to believe that. Yeah, but I've heard that there are uh, certain cultures. Well, tell me which one. Yeah, I, it's, I've discussed it before, and a friend of mine had read yeah, an article. I want to know which one. I want to yeah, go exactly, and see. Yeah, exactly. That's what I said as well. Yeah. I want to know. Yeah. I want to read it myself. Yeah. But, so uh, that's all you can ever do, I think. All generalizations are like this. You make yeah. a strong statement. Absolutely. You wait for somebody to come with a counterexample, and you continue to believe it until the counterexample arrives. And it's not enough to say, I've heard somebody say, that's not something mm -hmm. that's going to convince me. I want the, you know, chapter and verse, as they say, I want to see exactly what group it is and what they do, etc. Yeah. 
And if that comes, I will change my belief. But uh, that hasn't come yet. Okay, so it's a, it's a kind of guarded universality that, that the I'm proposing. Okay. Now, we need a little pause, maybe. I can see you getting a little tired. Before the break, I was trying to convince you that there might be some universal ethics. And now we have to look at the many cases where there is non-universality. So we, we, of course, have both. So how can cultural variation concerning ethical norms arise? Well, one reason is that people have different uh, focus of attention. What do they think is important? Property or religious practice? In some countries, it's a grave uh, thing to, uh, let's say, blasphemy. In many Muslim countries, blasphemy is a bad thing. And uh, in Christian countries a few hundred years ago, blasphemy was a bad thing. Nowadays, it doesn't meet with any, you don't get into much trouble if you blaspheme. <laughs> but in some countries, you do. Uh, property rights, you know, if you are in a country, there are countries where, well, there have been cultures where property has not been as important as in, in Western cultures. Uh, where people have shared a lot more. There have been. There is a book called The Tragedy of the Commons, which means that those things were, which were common property have tended to disappear, unfortunately, you might say. So we used to have a lot more in common, and there wasn't, there wasn't always this carving up, mine, yours, etc. So that, that has varied over the years. Um, there might also, as we will see, be conflict that what happens when there's a conflict of norms? We'll get to that. We talked about that before. What was it? Stealing versus killing. What happens in those situations? And there could be different norms for these contextual specifications, default conditions for the norms. Okay, so we've already talked about the fact that what your norm group is uh, actually shows some variation. So in India, there are large religions like Hinduism, Jainism, Buddhism, which all, to some extent, hold that all living beings are sacred and it's a bad thing to kill them. So uh, it, we should all really be vegetarians because it's wrong to kill other living beings for meat. This is an ethical commandment in, in uh, and maybe India is the place on this planet where that belief is, is held the strongest. Of course, but also in, in Western cultures there's a growing body of people who are vegetarian for ethical reasons. Whether, do we have any such people in the room now? There are no ethical vegetarians here. You are. <laughs> You are also. Hmm? No, not you. I am. Yes. You are too. I just said I don't want to go into the whole discussion. No, no. <laughs> now I can say I'm a, I'm a sympathizer. I have tried, but I've not been able. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, as they say. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay, so that that's one of the big cultural variations, actually. What 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 group of people do you? regard as being the relevant group for your, for your ethical norms. There have been you know, cases where we've had countries where one group of people has regarded another group of people as slaves. That means that uh, what is normal, let's take the United States until the Civil War. Uh, here it was okay to enslave mostly black people and to own them, to punish them, to whip them. You were not allowed to do that to white people. So you were allowed to behave in a different way to blacks than to whites. And, and this, this is because you had defined the group for which the ethical norms were valid as being the white people and not the black people. So there are many examples of how this, this has varied between different cultures. OK, what about clashing norms? So when one very uh, quite common clash is between not hurting and not lying. 
Okay? So let's say, uh, are you a singer? No? Anybody who is a singer in here? Nobody? You're a singer. No, no. But let's say we have a But let's say we had a singer and that person gave a performance and the performance was not very good. And you are that person's friend. How are you going to, okay, so you are going to now be in here in a difficult situation. Are you going to hurt that people by saying that it was terrible? Or are you going to lie and say something it was good when it was not good? Well, how are you going to, here's a clash between two ethical considerations. Not hurting, not lying. How are you going to solve this? Yeah, how? Can you say the truth in a way that it will hurt a person? Like, not revealing all the truth, like it was really awful, you were terrible, but also not lying that you were so great. Like saying, you should change something, something, something. So it's something in between. Lie, truth. Yeah. This is my, my best friend. It's like a couple, if she say, oh, I have to put it. Darling, am I fat? Oh no, you're not. But I think there's no way for him to say that she, you're a little big. There's no way to say truth in not offending way. Okay. In general, what we have here then is a case where, and this is true for for ethical norms generally, sub-optimization, sub-optimization. -optim okay. So you have to find a way of combining the norms where it's possible to live up to both to as large an extent as possible, but it's not possible to live up to both norms totally. That, okay, so the term sometimes used for this is sub-optimization or sub-optimization, depending on whether you want a more British or an American pronunciation of the word. Okay, so think about that's That's a situation we often find ourselves in ethics. But we might also now speculate that perhaps one way of going with this conflict is more popular, is preferred in one culture in a different way than it is in another culture. So let's say, could we have a culture where it is more important to tell the truth than to not hurt people? And another culture where it's more important not to hurt other people than to tell the truth? It has been claimed that Europe is a continent where we find exactly those differences. It has been claimed that North Europe, in general, to a larger extent, prefers to tell the truth and to hurt people. And South Europe prefers more to not hurt people and to lie. You can, you can think about this yourself. So, it's okay to a greater extent in many southern European countries to tell people compliments even if you don't believe in them, etc. In northern Europe you have a greater difficulty with that. So you don't say that the food is great if you don't think so, you don't say that the dress is great if you don't think so, etc. Et so it's both positive and negative. You're allowed to say positive things that you don't really believe and you should avoid negative things when they are required. That's, that's the not hurt culture. culture. Well, well, in the other culture, it's okay to hurt people a little. It's, the truth will never be bad for you. <laughs> isn't, it, isn't it a question of politeness? Yes. Sometimes it's not about hurting persons. Yeah, you but you might say then, is it polite to tell the truth? Not always. No, no, exactly. But, you know, so a lot of people who or for the not hurt, say it's more polite not to hurt people, and that it's impolite to tell the truth. While those who, uh, who believe more in truth, they say, we don't care about politeness, truth is always good. Maybe it's personal, it's more personal. It could be personal also, but what we're interested in right now is, is the cultural, that there might be a cultural uh, difference here. Of course it's also personal, I agree. I mean, within a culture you'll find people who are more on the truth line and less on the truth line. I have sort of a question. Are we differentiating between ethics and morals? No. Why not? Because we, I didn't find a good way to do it. <laughs> that's, that's why I had those slides where people, I said people disagree on morals and ethics. 
You're free to introduce a stipulative way of doing it. <laughs> well, I, in my personal opinion, obviously, uh, I would say that ethics are grounded within a certain system. They are, um, they are anchored to goals and values depending on, you know, the, uh, that contextual well, environment. And so when we were discussing um, in the, if it's all right, to, if it's okay to kill in war, for example, and so on, I would say that a person usually has different roles in different contexts. So for example, one can be a father at the same time be a soldier. And so when, for example, one faces his own son you know, in the enemy army, it would be ethical for the soldier to kill the enemy, but it would be unethical for a father to kill his own son. So you have a conflict of roles, and therefore a conflict of ethics mm -hmm. that are attached to those roles. Yeah, I agree, but how did the word moral come in here? Well, because, because morals are not, uh, they are not intrinsically anchored to a system. So, not necessarily. Which one of these was not anchored to a system? Both seem to be anchored. Well, yes, exactly. Both are ethical, uh, both are ethics. But morals are not necessarily anchored. Well, so you have this idea of morals that more the personal. Morals are very much more subjective than ethics yeah. are. No, I, I agree with that, but I haven't made systematic use of that distinction. But we both agree that the class between norms is possible, and that sometimes there could be group preferences in the way uh, these clashes go when you have to resolve them. But generally, there is this sub optimization process we have to make. Sometimes we see that the norms are clashing and we have to uh, work out a good solution. Another thing we have discussed already is that cultures can differ in the way uh, they contextually specify when the norm is valid and when it is not valid. Uh, so this is the default condition. Okay. When, when, can the, when is it okay for the state to take property from the uh, private citizens? It's, this presumably has differed a lot. Let's, let's take Russia. Where's our Russian lady? During the Soviet period, yes, the state could take property very much more easily than it can today. <laughs> right. So. If they say we'll bring, we could bring about ourselves. <laughs> yeah. So well, that's historical variation. But you can also see between different countries that the laws of allowing expropriation are different in different countries. So in some countries it's very difficult for the state to do this, in other countries it's quite easy. So, yeah, you know, these are all differences in how the contextual validity of, of the laws is specified. Okay, you can also look at uh, activities and you can see how different activities go with different ethical um, the roles or the factors that govern an activity can be related to ethics in different ways. So here we have uh, uh, we, uh, the first point here on purpose compares a dinner party to an academic seminar. And you might say that if you're in an academic seminar, maybe truth, telling the truth is the most important thing. And not hurting people is less important. So, you know, it's okay to say, no, you're wrong. It's like this. But if you're at the dinner party, it might be less okay to uh, go for truth. Maybe you should go more for not hurting other people. So, you know, it's, if somebody, one of the guests says, this food is really great, and you think it's horrible, it's, you would not going to say, no, you're wrong, it's horrible. <laughs> That's very unusual. So, um, you can see how activities well, the purpose of the activity will determine to what extent what the, what the kind of, when there is clash between ethical norms, which norms gets the upper hand. Role expectations. When there's a power difference, now here we come to the, an interesting question. How, how do power and ethics relate to each other? Um, so again, we can take this question of pain versus correct information. Freedom versus correct information is another uh, case of this. So if you're talking to somebody who is, has more power than you, your self-interest will normally probably lead you to put not hurting above telling the truth. Because if you tell the truth, that might hurt you yourself, right? 
So you will have consider often self interest of course cannot be left out of these calculations. And it will also play a role for how you balance the ethical norms against each other. Uh, okay, and now we are, we're moving, in a sense, when we move into this field, we, we move a little from ethics into etiquette and politeness, which we also discussed when we were discussing power. So norms of expression of politeness, respect, and how they differ with sex, age, power. Okay, so all of these, so then we get back to this question, when is something really ethics, when is something etiquette, when is something politeness, when is breaking a rule or following a rule not directly of ethical consequence, and when, it, and when is it more of an indirect consequence. <clears throat> Surroundings can make a difference sometimes. Uh, traits of the communicative <coughs> behavior, so some ways of, of doing things are more pleasant for people, some people are, some ways of doing things are, are less pleasant, and you might say that's okay, that, that has to do with the ethical norm of not hurting people, of giving pleasure rather than pain. <coughs> and if you use your power in a very overt way, that could be unethical in two ways, it could hurt somebody else, it could also be restricting that uh, other person's freedom, and so you can see how well, the exercise of power can interact with the trying to behave in an ethically correct manner. Okay, and um, when you go on analysis, anal analyzing this, um, well, there are lots of questions that can come up. So you can start to talk about types of communication, um, or some kind of jokes, uh, unethical, if they make fun of people's ethnic origin, or if they make fun of uh, their mental abilities, or if it makes fun of their gender, um, you know, so you start to wonder, is it okay if you laugh, or is that unethical or ethical? Maybe these things are also valued different in different cultures. A lot of questions of this type. Uh, you come into uh, things of like commitments, in many, many situations, uh, social organization relies on people promising each other to do things. And they make commitments, I'm going to do this by Thursday. So what happens if you've not done it by Thursday? This seems to be fairly, it's an ethical, I mean, you hurt the other person if you're not doing it. So it's clearly relevant for ethics. Do we have variation between cultures in the way co in the way commitments are honored or not honored? Any, anybody, have you ever experienced people who do not uh, do what they have promised to do? Yeah. Yeah. Yes? Is this more common in some places than others? Is it, for example, more common if you go to a, a government bureaucrat? Oh, yes. Can you expect a government bureaucrat to do what they have promised? No. No? Not in Russia. Not in Russia. <laughs> okay, so here we, come, here we come to something which could be culturally different. How much could you trust government officials, bureaucrats? You don't trust them. Not at all. Let's take a specific example. Would you trust the police? Depends on situations, but in most of the situations, not. Okay. <laughs> How many people come from countries where you would absolutely not trust the police? Me. Uh, ah. <laughs> How many people come from countries where you would trust the police? More than half. They're all Swedish. Yeah, yeah, in general, there is there is quite a lot of trial. I mean, I would say that some Swedes also do not trust the police, but, <laughs> but in general, there is quite a lot of trust for the police. And, and also trust uh, in the uh, reliability, in the reliability that bureaucrats will actually keep their commitments. This is a, a, well, it's an important part of social life. 
the ethics of, of, uh, of the officials of the organization that you're in. And that, you know, there are many aspects of that, of course. Honesty, commitments, not hurting, etc. And there is variation in, in what we can expect. So, for example, what is then an acceptable excuse for not keeping a commitment or honoring an obligation? Do, people, do the bureaucrats in your home, do they honor their commitments? To some extent. And if they haven't done it, what's an acceptable excuse? That they didn't know what to do. That's an acceptable excuse. <laughs> Well, that's interesting. That they didn't know what to do. I think that's unusual in Sweden. I think they wouldn't say I didn't do this because I didn't know what to do. Because then the reply from me would be, "Then you're obviously incompetent. Why do you have this job? <laughs> Get out." Maybe it wasn't prescribing their job. Yeah. Okay. It wasn't prescribed. So they didn't probably know that it was part of their task. Okay. Yeah, not much the things like that differ. So uh, in Sweden, uh, acceptable excuses, I think, are things that I was ill. Uh, you know, they use that as an excuse a lot of the time. I had to stay home, or I had to, uh, I don't know, uh, go. Uh, another Swedish excuse is I had to take my vacation. <laughs> you know, I, I had to take my vacation. You wonder. <laughs> That's not an excuse. Yeah. What? The problem with systems, like on computer, is not a problem properly, as in computer, this is one of the excuses. I can't speak louder. Yeah, I'm saying that if they have some problem with systems, yes. in computer systems, yes. this is one of the excuses. Well, that's one of the excuses. Yeah. Now, that's probably Sweden. So, taking vacations, problem with computer systems, being ill, these are all acceptable excuses in Sweden. Yeah. yeah, there's two sides cool. defining the acceptable word. Yeah, what is it? It might be acceptable or for the officials and the politicians to have a rule or a reason that they're ill, but it's not acceptable for the other party. We don't have to accept that. Well, your right. colleague says something that is, is acceptable for them, it doesn't mean that it, the other part actually accepts it. Yeah. No, I agree. But you also have to look, look at the legal system of the country. Uh, if you actually wanted to take that person to court, I mean, in Sweden it's actually possible in some cases to complain about an official and to have a legal complaint against them. Probably you would not be successful if their excuse had been that they were ill or, or that they had to take a vacation <laughs> or that the computer system broke down. So you would probably not be successful in, in uh, going after them. But if, you know, if some other excuses would not be valid according to the law, but probably those would be. So the, these are, yeah, these are things you have to, to look at. They can vary in between cultures. <clears throat> okay, then, it's, as, I, as I've said before, it's hard to say which norms are ethical and which norms are not so clearly ethical. And sometimes people use terms that make you think that something is ethics when, according to what I've been arguing here today, it perhaps isn't so clearly ethics. So one very, very uh, clear case of that is work ethics. Have you heard about the Protestant work ethic? No? Yes. Some of you have? No. Yeah. yeah. Most of you have. Some say that it is the beginning of the capitalism. That's what Max Weber claimed, yes? Yes. That's right. Uh, okay, so it means that uh, according to uh, Calvinistic Protestantism, God will give those a sign in this life that are the, among the chosen ones to enter heaven. The sign is that they are successful. Okay, successful in business, for example. So if you're successful, that means you're one of the chosen ones. So it's easy to reinterpret this, to think, if I work hard and I'm successful, I'll be one of the people to enter heaven. So according to the German sociologist Max Weber, this was a primary motivation for the growth of capitalism in Holland, Scotland, 
and the United States. Maybe he's right. Anyway, this was called the Protestant work ethic. Is it ethical? But you, not really according to what we've been saying here today. It's a little wider in some sense. Is it for the well-being of others? It seems mostly to be, the, if you, of course, if you have an ethical system where the only person who counts is yourself, <laughs> then it's, it's ethical, you could what say. What if you reach success by hurting other people? Well, that's not focused on in this particular view. <laughs> not in focus. Right, another case is sexual morals. Is that ethics in the sense we've been discussing? Well, it could be, maybe. But just having sex with somebody, does that necessarily hurt that person? No. <laughs> is it bad for anybody? Not necessarily. Why is it immoral then? Well, not in the sense we're discussing here. <laughs> yeah, you wanted to say? I, I think there are people that would claim that, for example, homosexuality diminishes somehow the value of their traditional marriage. Homosexuality? Yes. But I'm just talking about heterosexuality now. <laughs> sure, all yeah. kinds of sodomy. With the mini I'm not sodomy. <laughs> sodomy. <laughs> <laughs> but that depends on your definition, obviously. You know, some people regard sodomy as everything except, you know, traditional coitus. <laughs> yeah, but I'm talking about traditional coitus. Yes, but what, what I'm. <laughs> Or within a marriage, obviously. Yeah. Sexual morals could be, you know. And some people would say that it diminishes their marriage and therefore hurts them. I obviously do not agree, but, you know, there are those that, that claim such a thing. Yeah. But I only wanted to put your, take your attention to, you know, the words here are used in many different senses and it's not always exactly the way we've been discussing it today. And obviously, uh, the attitudes here to work if we take the, just take that, of course they differ. <laughs> Not everybody thinks that work is the salvation or the way to get to heaven. <coughs> Some people think that actually work is a necessary evil. And the best thing you can do in life is to sit down with your friends, have a good time and drink wine. <laughs> so that's a different attitude. And when it comes to sexual morals, well, again, we know that the attitudes differ a lot. Some people think it's quite okay and some people think it's less okay. <laughs> Attitudes to the other sex, well, are these moral? If you think that uh, men and women are equal, or if you don't think so, well, may, it has to do with the well-being of others. To some extent it is maybe ethical, to some extent perhaps not. Uh, respect for older and more powerful people, is this ethics? Well, again, the same thing. Maybe, you know, it's hurtful for other pe for older people if you're not respectful. So, maybe uh, there is an element here of not hurting, etc. But again, there are other aspects to this also. But it's hurtful for everyone if you're not respectful. That's true. So, you would say it has no special role. This one you would not like to call ethical. It's just a, a power room. This can be debated. Uh, view of human value. A lot of people think that every human being has a kind of, uh, yeah, undefinable value. Uh, that's part of some ethical systems. Perhaps not of all, but part of many systems. And that perhaps is a very strong reason for ethics. There are certain things you cannot do because people have, are supposed to have this value. I think in the uh, American Constitution, it starts with a statement about this. We believe that all human beings are, etc., etc. And maybe also in the UN uh, value scheme, you have some statement of this similar type. Uh, hospitality. Is it ethics? Somebody was claiming here before that it is not ethics. Uh, but I, you know, taking care of your guests, isn't that the question of the well-being of others? To some extent it is ethical. Views on the forces of nature and the supernatural. We have to believe that God created the world. Is it ethical? It's a religious belief, but perhaps not ethical. I don't know. 
doesn't seem to concern the well-being. Maybe it does. He created everything. He created human beings also. Some religious people would claim that you know people not believing in religion or you know say uh, voicing other views that uh, for the, their religion they you know they, they mean that it would um, endanger the uh, spirituality of the children. So in many cases they see it as a uh, as an attack, which is why, for example, atheists are you know. Look down upon it, for example, the US and well, other countries as well. Yeah, and most of the Muslim countries. Yes. It's not a good thing to be an atheist. Uh, but all of these things, whatever, even if you know they are not ethical, they do vary a lot between cultures. The views on these, most of these things, show some great variation. So they are very culturally variable, even if they only, to a certain extent, have ethical importance. They are important norms for behavior and for beliefs, but not perhaps totally ethical, all of them. Okay, today's uh, two seminars have been on power. <coughs> the last one now has been an overview of some of the issues related to ethics and communication and to ethics and intercultural differences. The first one then was an uh, attempt to show you a little about power and intercultural communication. Thank you very much.